So next on the agenda is the 2016 Income and Affordability Study, which will be presented by our senior research associate, Daniel Berger. <laughs> Good morning, Danielle, thank you. Good morning, thank you. The Income and Affordability Study is researched and presented each year in accordance with Section 26-510B of the Rent Stabilization Law, which requires the Rent Guidelines Board to consider relevant data from the current and projected cost of living indices and permits consideration of other measures of housing affordability in its deliberations. To assist the board in meeting this obligation, RGB research staff produce an annual income and affordability study, which reports on housing affordability and tenant income in New York City's rental market. This study highlights year-to-year -year changes in many of the major economic factors affecting New York City's tenant population and takes into consideration a broad range of market forces, rent levels, and public policies affecting housing affordability. Such factors include New York City's overall economic condition, including unemployment rates, the consumer price index, and gross city product, as well as housing in income and housing costs, the impact of welfare reform and federal housing policies on rents and incomes, and other relevant factors such as the number of eviction proceedings and homelessness levels. In summary, 2015 saw New York City with growth and gross city product which increased 3.4% during calendar year 2015, the sixth consecutive year of increase. The city also gained 119,000 jobs, and inflation rose at a slower rate than the previous year, with prices rising 0.1% on average during 2015 in the metro area. And real wages increased by 1.6% in real terms over the prior 12 months. The unemployment rate fell to 5.7%, and evictions fell by 18.1% during 2015. But homeless staying in city shelters increased, rising by 5.6%, while the number of cash assistance recipients also increased by 5.7%. And the number of food stamp recipients, now known as SNAP, fell for the second consecutive year, decreasing by 3.2%. New York City's gross city product, which measures the total value of goods and services produced, increased by 3.4% between 2014 and 2015, following a 2.1% increase in the prior year. On a quarterly basis, there was positive growth in all but one quarter since the first of 2009. In 2015, the greatest growth was during the first quarter, an increase of 4.3%. The United States economy saw gross domestic product increase as well, but at a slower rate than New York City, increasing by 2.4% in 2015, and showing positive growth on a quarterly basis in all but two quarters since the second quarter of 2009, including a 3.9% rise during the second quarter of 2015. The rate of inflation, as measured by the Consumer Price Index, which measures the change in the cost of typical household goods, rose at a slower pace during 2015, increasing at a slower rate, 0.1%, than the previous year. Sorry, it's 0 0.1, not 0 0.01. This rate increase follows increases over the past three years of 1.3%, 1.7%, and 2.0%. The U.S. CPI for urban consumers also increased 0.1% this year, 1.5 percentage points lower than the prior year. New York City's unemployment rate fell 1.5 percentage points during 2015 to 5.7%. Manhattan had this year's lowest borough unemployment rate at 4.8%, a decline of 1.3 percentage points. Queens's unemployment rate was the second lowest of the boroughs at 5.0% in 2015, down 1.3 percentage points from the previous year. Staten Island's rate was 5.8%, 1.6 percentage points lower than 2014. Brooklyn had the second highest unemployment rate of the boroughs, 5.9%, a 1.7 percentage point fall from one year earlier. And the Bronx once again had the highest borough unemployment rate, 7.7%, and fell two percentage points from 2014. 
The most recently available data for New York City shows unemployment rates of 5.9% in January and 5.9% in February of 2016. The U.S. rate also fell in 2015 down to 5.3%, a 0.9 percentage point decline. As this graph illustrates, 2015 saw falling unemployment rates for both New York City and the nation as a whole. The New York City rate is in green, and the U.S. jobless rate is in purple. The rate in New York City is now at its lowest level since 2008, when it stood at 5.6%. Coinciding with falling unemployment rates, employment levels in New York City grew for the sixth consecutive year. Overall, among both city residents as well as those commuting into the city, New York City gained 119,000 jobs in 2015, a 2.9% increase from 2014. There were gains in all sectors, including the construction sector, up 7.0%, adding 9,100 jobs, and the professional and business services sector, up 4.7%, adding 31,300 jobs and the leisure and hospitality sector, which rose 4.2%, adding 17,200 jobs. All other sectors increased from between 0.8% and 3.4%. The most recently available numbers from January and February of 2016 show a 2.7% increase in total employment as compared to the previous January and a 2.6% increase as compared to the previous February. As this graph shows, New York City gained 119,000 jobs in 2015, the sixth consecutive year of increase. We also look at wage data, though the analysis is limited by the fact that there is a significant lag time in reporting of the income data. The most recent annual numbers via the quarterly census of employment and wages, which cover the 2014 calendar year and are still preliminary, reveal a 3.9% increase in real wages, that is, wages that have been adjusted for inflation, and a 5.3% increase in nominal wages for 2014. The data is based on quarterly tax filings by businesses in New York State and captures approximately 97% of all non-farm employment. During the most recent 12-month period, the fourth quarter of 2014 through the third quarter of 2015, Real wages rose by 1.6% and nominal wages by 1.8%. Note that this data is also still preliminary. In the finance and insurance sector, which accounts for more than a quarter of all wages in New York City, wages rose by a real 0.1%. In the administrative, waste, educational, and health services sectors, which account for 16% of wages, wages rose by a real 2.4%. In the professional and technical services sector, which accounts for 13% of all wages, real wages rose by 2.9%. And in the government sector, which accounts for 10% of all wages, wages rose by a real 3.1%. Wages also rose in most other sectors, including accommodation and food services, which increased a real 2.0%, and trade, which rose a real 1.3%, and arts, entertainment, and recreation, which rose 6.2%. These are all sectors which may increase further over the next few years as New York State implements a minimum wage increase to $15 by the beginning of 2019. And looking at real wage growth by quarter in 2015, real wages were down 0.9% in the first quarter and up 2.8% in the second quarter and 2.2% in the third quarter as compared with the same quarters of the prior year. Wage growth in this 12-month period was bolstered by an increase of 3.0% in the fourth quarter of 2014. The Bureau of Labor Statistics also tracks wage data through their current employment statistics survey. This survey is much more current than that of the quarterly census, but cannot be broken out by industry, is a much smaller sample size, and does not include monetary compensation such as bonuses. Per this survey, weekly wages in New York City during 2015 rose 3.1% in nominal terms and 3.0% in real terms. As this graph shows, both real and nominal wages increased in the most recent 12-month period. Real wages are shown in 2015 dollars and reflect wages from the first three quarters of the year shown 
plus the fourth quarter of the prior year. Per the 2014 American Community Survey, the most recently available data, the New York City poverty rate for all individuals is 20.9%. By borough, it is 14.5% in Staten Island, 15.2% <coughs> in Queens, 17.6% in Manhattan, 23.4% in Brooklyn, and 31.6% in the Bronx. The poverty rate for all individuals in the U.S. is 15.5%. Looking at rates in New York City by age, for those under the age of 18, the poverty rate in New York City is 29.6%. For those aged 18 to 64, the poverty rate is 18.4%. For those aged 65 and older, the poverty rate is 19.3%. And looking more closely at families in New York City, for all families, the poverty rate is 17.6%. For families with related children under the age of 18, the poverty rate is 25.0%. For married couples families, it is 10.7%. For female-headed families, the poverty rate is 31.6%. And for male-headed families, the poverty rate is 16.2%. 2014 HVS data was released in February of last year. This triennial survey of the housing and demographic characteristics of the city's residents found that the citywide vacancy rate was 3.45% in 2014, well below the 5% threshold required for rent regulation to continue <coughs> under state law. Queens had the lowest vacancy rate in the city at 2.69%, translating into the availability of just 12,070 rentals in a borough with 449,274 rental apartments. Manhattan, by contrast, had the highest vacancy rate in 2014 at 4.07%. Of the remaining boroughs, the Bronx's rate stood at 3.77% and Brooklyn at 3.06%. And the sample size in Staten Island was too low to calculate an accurate vacancy rate. As you can see in this graph, the HVS found Vacancy rates varying significantly among different asking rents. As might be expected, apartments renting for the least had the lowest vacancy rates, while those apartments renting at the higher end generally had substantially higher vacancy rates. Apartments with an asking rent of less than $800 had a vacancy rate of just 1.8%, while those renting for at least $2,500 had a vacancy rate of 7.3%. According to the 2014 HVS, which reflects household income for 2013, the median income for all households stood at $50,400 in 2013, a 1.6% real or inflation adjusted decrease from 2010. The median income for rental households was $41,500, a 1.1% real increase. In con contrast, owner occupied households maintained substantially higher incomes, which in 2013 stood at $80,000, almost double the average income of renters, but unchanged in real terms from 2010. The 2014 HVS again found different income levels among those living in different types of apartments. Rent controlled tenants earned a median of 29,000 in 2013, a 3.6% real decrease. Tenants living in stabilized buildings earned a median income level of $40,600, including a median of $40,000 for tenants in pre-war buildings and $46,000 in post-war buildings, a real decrease of 0.3% for rent-stabilized tenants as a whole, and real increases of 2.3% for tenants in pre-war units and 0.3% for tenants in post-war units. However, tenants in non-regulated units had higher household incomes than rent regulated tenants at $58,000 in 2013, a real increase of 7.7%. And those living in other regulated <coughs> units, such as public housing and Mitchell Lama, earned a median household income of $18,296, a real decrease of 3.1%. Looking at rent levels in 2014, the median monthly gross rent, which includes fuel and utilities, for all rental units was $1,325, a real inflation-adjusted increase of 4.3% from 2011. 
Rent stabilized tenants paid slightly less than the typical rental tenant with a median gross rent of $1,300, a real increase of 5.3%. Pre-47 rent stabilized units paid a median of 1,266 and post-46 a median of 1,413, real increases of 3.9% and 9.4% respectively. Rent controlled tenants paid less than rent stabilized tenants, a median of $1,020, a real increase of 8.1% from 2011. While tenants living in private non-regulated rentals paid $1,625, a real increase of 2.7%. And tenants living in other regulated rentals such as public housing paid $595, an inflation adjusted decrease of 6.0% from 2011. The HVS breaks down the distribution of renter occupied housing by gross rent level. As you can see in this graph of the 2.1 million rental units in New York City, 7.3% rent for less than $500, 7.2% rent for between $500 and $799, 9.7% of units rent for between $800 and $999, 36.5% for between $1,000 and $1,499, 19.7% rent for between $1,500 and $1,999, and the remaining 19.5% rent for over $2,000 a month. Examining the affordability of rental housing, the 2014 HVS reported that the median gross rent to income ratio was 33.8%, meaning that half of all households residing in rental housing pay more than 33.8% of their income and gross rent and half pay less. This is the same ratio as 2011 and equal to the highest ratio ever reported in the HVS. Rent control tenants saw a median gross rent to income ratio of 35.5%, an increase from 31.7% in 2011. The median gross rent to income ratio of stabilized households is 36.4% including ratios of 37.0% in pre-war units and 34.7% in post-war units, increases of 1.6 percentage points for rent-stabilized tenants as a whole, 1.5 percentage points for pre-war tenants, and 0.9 percentage points for tenants in post-war units. An analysis of data by the Rent Guidelines Board found that the rent-to-income ratio reported in the HVS are artificially high due to the way the ratio for those tenants on Section 8 are reported. The RGB estimates that the median gross rent to income ratio for rent stabilized tenants who do not receive Section 8 is 33.5% and the out of pocket rent to income ratio for all rent stabilized tenants <coughs> including those on Section 8 is 32.2%. This ratio is the rent to Gross rent to income ratio is 33.0% for those in non-regulated rentals, a decrease of 0.7 percentage points from 2011, and is 30.3% for those in other regulated rentals, a decrease of 0.6 percentage points. And one-third of rental households pay more than 50% of their household income in gross rent, 0.4 percentage points greater than 2011. Another source of rent information comes from the annual American Community Survey conducted by the Census Bureau. Looking at monthly contract and gross rent from 2005 through 2014 in real 2014 dollars shows that from 2005 to 2014, rent has increased in inflation adjusted terms by approximately $155 a month. The American Community Survey also reports on gross rent to income ratios. Looking at these ratios from 2005 through 2014, they have ranged from a low of 29.9% in 2007 to a high of 32.7% in 2014. The American Community Survey also reports on renter housing costs as a percentage of income for different income brackets. As household income increases, so does housing affordability. 88.7% of households making less than $20,000 a year have a housing cost to income ratio in excess of 30%. But at the upper limit, 
those households making at least $75,000 a year, the ratio who spend at least 30% of income on housing costs drops to 10.9%. One of the many prices tracked in the Federal Consumer Price Index is the cost of rental housing, which increased by 3.1% in 2015 in the New York metro area. For comparison, rents in the U.S. as a whole rose 3.6% during 2015. The same seven cities are compared to New York each year to see how the rise in rents in our metro area compares to other major metro areas nationwide. Rents in the New York metro area rose faster than Philadelphia and at the same rate as Washington, D.C., but rose more slowly than rents in San Francisco, Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Over the 47-year period of rent stabilization from 1968 through 2015, overall prices in the New York City metro area rose 622%, while the cost of rental housing rose 750%. This is the converse of what happened in the U.S. as a whole, where overall prices rose more quickly than rental housing by 581% and 561% respectively. Over the last 20 years, the number of recipients of cash assistance, formerly known as public assistance, has dropped significantly, falling 68% since March of 1995 <coughs> when the city's welfare reform initiative began. During 2015, an average of 361,913 persons were receiving cash assistance, an increase of 5.7% from a year earlier. Overall, there was a 16.2% de decrease in the number of new cash assistance applications during 2015, with denied applications falling by 21.2% and approved applications by 12.6%. There was also a decrease of 2.1% in cash assistance recipients placed in jobs than in the prior year. But the number of recipients of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistant Program, formerly known as food stamps, fell by 3.2% in 2015. This is the second consecutive drop in SNAP recipients, although levels are still more than double that of the early 2000s. Medicaid enrollment also fell during 2015 by an average of 15.5%. The green portion of this graph shows the number of recipients in the Family Assistance Program, and the darker purple shows the number of recipients in the Safety Net Assistance Program. The light purple bars represent the number of recipients who have transferred from the Family Assistance Program to the Safety Net Assistance Program. In 2015, cases rose by 5.7%. During calendar year 2015, the number of homeless in Department of Homeless Services shelters increased for the seventh straight year. Homelessness among all persons was up 5.6% over 2014 levels to an average of 57,158 persons sheltered each night. While the average number of families with children sheltered each night increased 4.8%, and the number of children and families increased by 0.6%. The number of adult families also rose by 8.8%, and single adult levels were up 13.4%. But more families with children were relocated to permanent housing, an increase of 16.9% over 2014 levels. Adult families also saw more permanent housing placements, up 1.5%, but single adult placements decreased 9.8%. Corresponding to increased shelter censuses, the length of stay in temporary housing increased. Up three days for families with children to an average of 435 days, up 24 days for adult families to 551 days, and up 26 days for single adults to 342 days. This chart shows homelessness levels for all individuals during calendar years 1985 through 2015. As you can see, levels increased 5.6% during 2015, the seventh consecutive <coughs> year of increase. The impact of economic conditions on New York City's renters can also be examined through housing court data. Specifically, housing court actions are reviewed to determine the proportion of tenants who are unable to meet their rental payments. The number of non-payment filings in housing court decreased 2.4% to 203,119 during 2015, 
the fourth consecutive year of decline. And there was also a decrease in the number of non-payment filings that resulted in court appearances, known as calendar cases, which, 12, which fell 12.5% 12 in 2015. Because the number of court appearances fell at a greater pace than non-payment filings fell, the proportion of filings that resulted in court appearances fell 6.3 percentage points to 54.8%. And due to the number of evictions falling at a greater rate than the decrease in calendar cases, a lower proportion of cases that went to trial resulted in eviction, decreasing from 21.1% in 2014 to 19.7% in 2015. And evictions, regardless of the number of calendar cases, decreased by 18.1% in 2015. As this chart shows, over time, the proportion of filings that are calendared, that is the proportion of non-payment cases that actually make it before a judge, which is in purple, has been increasing over time, while the proportion of those cases that actually result in an eviction or possession in green <coughs> has been much more steady. In 2015, the proportion of filings that are calendared fell 6.3 percentage points, and the proportion of calendared cases that resulted in an eviction fell by 1.4 percentage points. For the second consecutive year, a tax credit is in effect for New York City renters, the enhanced real property tax credit for homeowners and renters. The maximum rebate is $500 and the maximum household income for those filing is $200,000 a year. The amount of the credit depends on both your income level and the amount of rent you pay annually, with those making less than $100,000 earning the biggest credits and those making more than $150,000 <coughs> earning the least. For instance, a household with an annual income of $50,000 a year who pays 30% of their income towards rent would be eligible for a $16.31 tax credit. But if the same household were to pay 50% of their income towards rent, their tax credit would be $87.19. But higher income households, those with incomes of at least $100,000, get a smaller tax credits proportionally. For instance, a household making $100,000 a year would need to spend at least 31.7% of their income towards rent before they would be eligible for any type of refund. In summary, the city's eco economy increased in 2015 for the sixth consecutive year, rising by 3.4%. Gross city product has increased in all but one quarter since the first of 2009. And there was an increase in employment levels up 2.9%, or a gain of 119,000 jobs. The unemployment rate fell to 5.7% citywide during 2015, a decrease of 1.5 percentage points. Real wages increased during calendar year 2014 by 3.9% and rose during the most recent 12-month period by 1.6%. There were increases in the number of cash assistance cases, which rose 5.7%. There was a decrease in non-payment court filings of 2.4%, while evictions fell by 18.1%. But homeless levels rose for the seventh consecutive year, up 5.6%. Thank you, and if you have any questions. I have a question. Who would like to go first? So just on the, in the chart on page 18, um, is, the, is the, when you say the proportion of calendared uh, cases that result in eviction and uh, possession. Is, is the green line a percentage of the purple line? N no, they're, they overlap a little, but they're different. The green line is, um, so the court process is that a, a landlord would file against you for an eviction proceeding. And then only a certain number of those cases are actually calendared, which means they're heard by a judge. A lot of them are dismissed before they ever get to court. So then you go to court and you're either evicted or not evicted. So the green line is the proportion that actually went to a judge that resulted in eviction. But is it a proportion of the initial filings or a proportion no, of the ones that No, it's a proportion of, the number of calendared cases are a proportion of the number filed. Right. You can't be calendared unless you were initially filed. So this is, you went before a judge and then you were actually evicted. No, I understand what the different 
uh, actions are. But so, for example, if there were 100 cases that were filed, mm -hmm. right, and then you're saying 55 of those would have been uh, calendared, right? Right. So then when you say 20%, is that 20% of 55 or 20% yes. of 100? 20% of 55. Okay. So that, I mean, I feel like this, that's, it would be helpful to look at the, uh, this is a little misleading in the sense that this looks like a much lower number than it actually is, is if it's 20% of 55% versus 20% of the total. This chart, I think. But I don't think this can be possible because if you uh, lay on the files in action against the tenant and the tenant never answers and the case is never calendar, the tenant can still be evicted because there's, there's a, a, you know, they get a warrant and the case is never calendared and that the eviction goes forward. So it, I'm not sure how it can be of the 55 instead of the 100. Um, I mean, we can definitely do the proportion regards to what was filed. That's a number we can provide. Right. I think I, that would be helpful, but also just understanding. So, for example, if it's 20% of 55, that's, uh, you know. I, I think, Helen, what you're looking for is more right. detailed information because right. they can tell us what percentage of the evictions were cases that were never calendared right. and resulted in eviction right. versus the helpful. cases where calendar tenants answered and those cases resulted in an eviction. <laughs> so the two separate buckets that we could get information for, which might be much more inf useful information than this general information. I think so. I, I would have to ask Housing Court if they can provide that information. We get it from them, so I can't guarantee that we can get information like that. So we're talking about the percent of evictions in non-calendared cases is what we're looking to get information on? I think we're looking for the percentage of evictions in non-calendared cases versus the percentage of evictions in calendared cases. I think we don't okay. have either mm -hmm. number at this point. And if we could find out also what percentage of any of those are rent stabilized units? No, we cannot. But can't we? I mean, I know we know that the, it's, it's been asked before, and they've they've said that they can't do it. Well, it, the data is available because every filing has whether it's rent stabilized. It would just require someone to go and collect and do a sampling of the data. But also, the Department of Homeless Services must. They ask the question when someone's coming to the shelter system, you know, were you coming out of, where were you leaving from? So some ways the information could be gotten either through housing court data research or through requesting information from Department of Homeless there, Services. There's information in the report regarding a report that was done by OMB. It took them years to do that report. They had to geocode what was rent stabilized. We don't have those capabilities. And it took them, I mean, the, the information, even when it came out in 2014, was dated. It was back to 2012. So we certainly don't have the ability to do anything like that. But can we, can we request that uh, sister agencies, DHS, HRA, OCA, someone in this alphabet soup can get us information to be more useful for us around, because we care about rent stabilized units. And, if 50% of the units of people going to the homeless shelter are unstabilized, that's one piece of information. If it's 10%, that's really a different piece of information. And I think it's really valuable for us to know of the percentage of evictions. It could have gone, it looks great, the number of people being evicted went down by 5,000 units. But if it has nothing to do with what we're dealing with here, that may, it's not as useful in our determination. Where it sounds like there are two different kinds of information you're talking about, because one relates to percentage of non, trying to get percentage of non-calendar cases, or for that matter, percentage of calendar cases that result in evictions that are rent stabilized. And you believe that housing court collects that information? They do not. They, when, what I said is they know who's evicted, because every, every index case, every, every index number that's filed in the petition, it lists whether the unit's rent stabilized or not. No one's Called the data, but the data is available. They, they've told me that they do not ask if the apartment is rent stabilized. Certainly the address, but again, it would have to be geocoded. And then the issue that you see even in the report of what OMB did, even if you geocode it, you can only get to buildings that contain rent stabilized units. You can't get to whether the unit is rent stabilized. But, but Danielle, you, I have to say something. 
I mean, I've been a tenant lawyer for a long time, and when you go, when an owner files a petition, the landlords can certify this. They list on their petition whether the unit's rent stabilized or not. So in the petition that's filed with the housing court, which is a publicly available document, that document says whether the unit's rent stabilized or not. I mean, Scott, t t tell, I, you know, Mary, tell me if I'm wrong. I can ask them again. I, I've asked them. They told me that they don't have it, but I will certainly ask again. So just so I understand, you believe that the petition that is filed, which commences a housing court case, has some place where you indicate whether a unit, the unit under litigation, is considered, is rent stabilized or not? I mean, I'm not an attorney and don't do filings, um, but it, it would seem logical that that would be the case. Well, the tenant, the tenant has protection. The tenant has consumer protections as being a rent-stabilized tenant, so it is germane for the judge to understand if they are a rent-stabilized lease versus a market-rate lease. I mean, it would be germane to any case. Well, I think there's two things going on. Whether it's asked or not and the information is there, it's got to be entered somewhere digitally. That, that's the issue. It, whether, it's, whether it's not or not, that's probably what they're telling us. We don't have that data because it's not in their computers. Whether they're going to take the extra step and go through all the filings and figure that out, it seems as though IBO did something like that, and they found that 43% of the evictions were coming from unstabilized buildings, and that's data between a period of 2002 and 2012. I don't know if that number would change very much, but we have a number of 43%. So uh, that could certainly still be the number, but I think that's a number and it's, it's a good number. So I think 43% is, is, or thereabouts is, is your answer. I'm sorry, who's the IBO? I'm sorry? IBO, you said? Uh, Independent Budget Office, oh, yes, okay, yes, thank you. sorry, I'm talking. Uh, and when was that study done? It was released in 2014, but they look at a period between 2002 and 2012, a 10-year period. So that's a 10-year period. I is that the same study you were referring yes, to? Yes, it is. Daniel? Okay, thank you. And then there's another question that you have, which is whether the homeless shelters collect information about where people are coming from. And do we know whether that information is collected? In other words, when someone comes to a homeless shelter, does someone gather information well, about whether they were in a rent-stabilized apartment so or not? People, what happens is there's a centralized processing center for people who are requesting shelter from the city. The Department of Department Home, uh, Homeless Services does an intake with people, and then, uh, then people get into the shelter system with that process. It is it was my understanding that they've requested that information. I don't know if we've ever gotten that from DHS. Uh, again, it, we've asked them, and even this study that's referenced in the report and was in much more detail in last year's report, if you want more details, they ask you the address that you're coming from. That's why it had to be geocoded, and that's why even that number is not exactly accurate because they geocoded it to buildings that are either Mitchell Lama or buildings that contain rent stabilized units. They could not get to whether the actual unit was rent stabilized because it's not reported to them, just the address of the last place that they resided. But, but Daniel, that's the prior administration, so we don't know whether the current administration is now asking information. That, that's true. Right, that might be useful just to find out. So we need to find out from the Department of Homeless Services what the intake, current intake process is in terms of information gathering, right? I have, I have one question just um, from my work on building affordable housing. AMIs were just released kind of in the last week or two from HUD. How does, how does the HUD AMI, which was up 5% this year, how does that correlate to the HVS? Or, or do the two, are they just two independent I, I don't know how the AMI is said exactly. I'm not sure how they, I mean, I know that they determine, you know, what the rents are in the area, um, right. but I'm not sure exactly how they go about doing that. The HVS is only every three years, and the AMIs are updated every year, every year right. so I would think it's not related to that. 
Um, but I'm I'm actually not sure how but they the do AMI that. also the M related to the MSA, which includes northern New Jersey. It's not New yeah. York City specific. Yeah. It, yeah. Not yeah. Well, uh, I think AMI it, for New York, York City. We have it. We have a New York City AMI. The suburbs have their own AMIs. Westchester has its own AMI, Long which Island is substantially too. higher than the city. Um, I don't know where they get the rents from. We can find out. Uh, Danielle, I have, I have a question in reference to the medium gross rent to income ratio. And you stated, I think, for rent stabilized tenants, or it said it in the report, 36.4% uh, is that ratio. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, 50% of rent stabilized tenants pay more than 36.4% of their income correct. in rent. And 30% is a threshold for at risk, correct? Or burden. Burden is the correct term, right? It's considered affordable housing if you pay less than 30%. Okay. But you hinted that Section 8 muddies that sort of number. Can you just clarify that a little bit? Sure. Um, what happens when the HVS is being conducted is that somebody comes to your apartment and they ask you how much your rent is. They ask you how much your income is. They also ask you how much you pay out of pocket, which means um, if you were getting some sort of subsidy, then your rent out of pocket is less than that. So what happens in Section 8 is that because these tenants are usually paying no more than 30% of their income towards rent, some of them are paying as little as 20%. There's a certain number who choose to pay more than that because they go into an apartment that's over the limit of what Section 8 will pay. But let's just say that 30% is the average. When they're asked what their rent is, their rent is $1,500 a month. And then their monthly income is $1,500 a month. So their gross rent to income ratio is 100%, which brings it up because I think there's like 80,000 Section 8 tenants in rent stabilized units. So it's almost 10% of the units are Section 8. But in reality, what they're paying is 30%. So um, what we did is an analysis to take out the units of people who are paying with Section 8 on the premise that they're generally not paying more than 30% of their income. And then we've also included the out-of-pocket rent-to-income ratio. So that would be everybody who's rent stabilized, including the Section 8, including the people who have some sort of other rental subsidy program. Because that's asking you just literally what you take out of your pocket every month to pay the rent compared to what your monthly income is. Yeah, and can you verify that number? Because I vaguely recall from the reading that there's 100,000 through NYCHA and 40,000 uh, through an HPD program. They could blend, but I c the, the 100,000 you said for Section 8. Yeah, it's. Um, it is 80,000? 80, okay. It's 80,000 for the NYCHA and then 40 something thousand for HPD. And um, not all of them are in rent stabilized units. But a, you know, a large proportion are. What page are you on? It's page twelve. Thank you. Answer to is there clarity on when the when the when the Section Eight tenant is taken out of the data set? Is there is there a number of yes, what the in, rent burden is? It's in the report on page ten. What is that? Is it lower than the 36.4 percent? Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it's 33.5 percent in 2014, and the out-of-pocket rent-to-income ratio for all rent-stabilized tenants is 33.2. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, can I just on page eight, so I'm clear, Danielle, you say basically for rent stabilized tenants, their median income has decreased. So you're basically saying for rent stabilized tenants, their their in, the overall income for them, even though we've had an increase decrease in unemployment and increase in job growth, for them their overall income is going down. The, this income number is from 2013, so it is. Even when it came out last year, it was somewhat dated, and now it's even more dated. So 2000, 
this number 2013 to 2014 is going down, but we're using employment data for 2015, 2016. So you, it's hard to connect those two numbers, you're saying? Yeah, I mean, there's no other choice. The HVS is the only source of rent stabilized data. Yeah, it's the only source that actually teases out the stabilized apartment. The ACS information that we have in here, which is from 2014, it's all apartments. Which you is can't, rest, you right, can't. Right, we can't. You, so it's less valuable information because it doesn't help us if, you know, if all tenants are doing well, but the rent stabilized tenants who we're focusing on right. are doing well yeah. or poorly. Right. right. So this is the only. But it, I, you know, it may show a trend, and that's. And over do we time. have that trend about uh, for rent stabilized tenants about income? Have you have we seen that charted out over a well, few? Well, and years? how it correlates with overall economic conditions. Yeah, just for the rent stabilized tenants, so we've seen that trend out. Because so we have a decrease of 0.3 percent. As a one-year number, it may be relevant or not, but over a longer period of time, it might be more. What's the relationship in terms of figuring out what to do with this 2015 data? Yeah, if we see a trend based on inflation in relationship to, you know, the overall job growth could have an impact on the overall tenant population, but if we tease it out just for rent stabilized tenants over a period of time, that'll be much more useful data if we could do that. Uh, I, I would cautiously say we could do that. Um, the HVS does sort of not recommend sometimes comparing year-to-year -year data. So I would have to check if we're able to do that. And then if you want to tell me exactly what you want compared, then. Is it, is it the income? You're looking well, at? Yeah. This is, we're talking about income. So if we're saying job growth and salaries are going up overall, but it's not really as relevant if we're talking about the rent stabilized units. And the only data we have is, it sounds like a 2013 number, which says there's been a decrease in overall income rent stabilized tenants. If we can have that charted out over some period of time and relate that to overall job growth, we can at least see how the job growth is uh, trending in relationship to rent stabilized income. Like if there, if there is a correlation, we can see it. If we there isn't, you want to see a correlation between rent stabilized income and the various economic indicators. Right. Oh, I think the assumption is if everyone's doing better, so are rent stabilized tenants, but that might not be true, right? No, I agree. I'm just saying I, I, it's, it's hard to think of a way in which that correlation would be caused in terms of your participation in the overall economy based on the type of housing that you live in. But maybe, I don't yeah, on that note, I'm, I was a little shocked to see the 0.1% real increase in income for fire, in, I mean, uh, for finance and insurance. Yeah. I, I think it's I mean, largely, that's largely related to bonuses. Yeah, bonuses and stock options. So the numbers are fucked to begin yeah, with. Yeah, it's interesting. We've, we've been teasing that number out for I'm five in the wrong or, business, I think. <laughs> <laughs> like five or six years. And I think, is this the first time that it was? You teased it out, and actually the number one <laughs> went up. Is well, that? Um, I think, I last think there year was a year right. that, it, that it went down. Right. Um, I don't have the numbers. Yeah, yeah, me, but, but we do tease that out because it, it I think be. it's better. It's but best to look at both. 13 to 14, there was that much downsizing in an industry. And, well, and finance and insurance does in, includes real estate or does not include real estate? It includes real estate. I think it's 14. It's that, that number is on the... 2014 calendar year or the year that we create? That was on the year that we created. Okay, so it's, so it's, it's the fourth the quarter, quarter of 2014 to the third quarter of 2015. That's the most current data exactly that we... So it doesn't, it doesn't take in this past, you know, bonus period from January to that quarter is when you get bonuses of January to No, it, it to takes March. in that... It's taking in the... the yeah, the, the previous one, quarter. but not the It's the not prior. taking in this quarter, but you can see if you look at it on a quarterly basis that the decrease was really in the first quarter, which is when they get their bonuses. So that's probably what happened. Although also, when is the wage number in per individual average wage, or is it in the <coughs> overall cumulative wages? They t the overall wage number is you add up all of the wages and all of the employment and it's divided in, and then for each industry, that's done individually. Got it. Okay. Other questions? Um, I just have one question. Is, is there a sense, economically, that we are almost reaching full employment? Mm. 
I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I did in the last section, in the conclusion, you know, some of the agencies in the city that are better equipped to make those uh -huh. guesses, you know, they, I included some of that data and, you know, they showed it, I think, still rising, but maybe not more quite slowly. as, yeah, a little yeah. more slowly, but I can't personally speak to yeah. that. Plus, I'm assuming, I mean, we haven't looked here at labor market participation. Right. It, which is, you know, had, has been at historically low levels. If so there is, the labor market participation numbers are reported on page um, five. On page? Page five. Got it. But so I, I think that's a very relevant question to a question related to full employment. Because those don't right. have it recovered. So it looks like page five, the second column. <clears throat> yeah, it's up to 61.1% from 60.8%. That's employed or actively looking. Is this the same statistic that I was asking you about earlier? I believe it was. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, yeah. one of the questions I, I had is how do you define employment? Um, because um, as I understood from our prior conversation, this is really a snapshot of a moment in time as opposed to looking at whether any of these particular people are employed full time, part time, temporarily, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, this particular data set doesn't allow you to do that. There is, um, in the section where I report on wage data, there is a survey, so it's not actual data, it's a survey. That survey does ask people how many hours a week they're working. So if you want to know if there was an increase or decrease in the number of, average number of hours per week working, I can certainly give that to you. But again, it's not, it's, it's a survey. Okay, thank you. The the wage data that I reported, I I, I would assume so. It's people who are filing taxes, so I would assume if you're self-employed, you file taxes, but I never specifically looked into it. Not Greece. <laughs> Other questions for Danielle? No? Okay, thank you, Danielle. So we now have an opportunity for a further board discussion. Um, are there particular, I know we have one topic outstanding. Can I jump in for, before we start that discussion? Um, I had invited HPD to come to the April 21st meeting, which now has been changed, sort of that format to the April 14th. I'm still awaiting whether they can make that switch. Um, so if you have questions for HPD, certainly send them to me and I can forward them to them. Um, the sooner the better by Monday if you can get me some questions. I'll, I'll send an email reminder out to folks today. Um, but if not, I would, I, I would probably, re if they can make the 14th, have them come in May to that May meeting. And so the questions will, you know, submit your questions either way. I'll, they'll come, but it's just a question of whether they can switch their schedule for that time. Um, and then just briefly, I forgot, <laughs> you know, with the passing of Leanne, we actually hired a new staff member. Um, Charmaine Superville, which I don't know if she's here or not. There, there she, is, she is in the back. Wave, Charmaine. Welcome, Charmaine. Char Charmaine um, was with us um, for 10 years up to 2012, budget cuts and 
um, our reduction in our budget, whatever. But so we were welcome, very welcome to have her back. And I failed to mention that. So welcome back, Charmaine. And I'm sure some of the people, thank you, Anne. Some of the people recognize Charmaine. She's, she's a wonderful thing. Andrew, and what do you need names for the tenant panel and the owner's panel? Okay. When do you need information on those names? Um, as you get them, great. I, I can wait up until like the day before. Don't please do that to me, but yeah, the sooner you get the data, the more you have. Um, I like to include it in the agenda so we know what groups we're dealing with and whatnot. So if you can get that to me uh, Tuesday before, and so it would be by the, by the 19th, that would be great. Um, but send it along as you get it. It would be great. Well, ask them again. Yeah, that would be the twenty-sixth meeting. I, I have. Uh, uh, usually, I, I send it to them in the you know beginning of May. Um, but you can, you can resubmit. <laughs> um, I can set. What I'll do is, along with that HPD reminder, I'll send around the questions from last year, so you guys have them and their answers. And any additional ones you want to add, you're welcome to. So. Okay, hey, other talk, I want to come back to um, Harvey's question about the Uptown Manhattan meeting, um, but um, any other topics that folks would like to address at this point? Well, I, I, I am in agreement with Harvey. I, I, you know, I, I defer to others in the room as to how we achieve Gail Brewer's request, but I think the request is a very reasonable request. Um, I still, and I had mentioned to the chair, you know, I, do have a little bit of agitation that we neglect Staten Island, both for owners and tenants. And uh, you know, it is part of our city. And I think we, under the mayor, have tried to have a one city philosophy. So I am a little hard pressed as to how we don't make it to Staten Island. So again, I understand there's calendar constraints, but I would, you know, I personally would be more than happy to suspend the time needed to go to Staten Island. I'd be more than happy to take additional time to meet with tenants and owners who can't meet us during the earlier Manhattan session. And does that mean you are generally in favor of an additional uptown session or just the extension of time for the downtown I, session? I, I, I'm agnostic to either. I, I, I think though the I think Gail's point, I mean, it, it obviously would be nice to, as a developer, we usually go to people where people are. So I, I don't disagree with Gail. but. If, if the answer is not doing it at all versus extending our time at CUNY, I would vote for extending our time at CUNY. If we can have our pie and eat it too, then I'm happy to, to go wherever Harvey can get a space. Um, and I feel the same way about Staten Island. Okay, so have you. Yeah, well, I, I agree with both. Harvey and Scott about the, the scheduling. And the other thing, maybe just to add to our percolating, I know last year we had some testimony from the Furman Center and some sort of uh, external kind of academic experts on that to round out our understanding of the, the what's going on with housing in the city. And uh, maybe this year it's even harder given our compressed schedule, but uh, uh, if there's a way we could hear from them again, or if they have uh, some paper submission maybe that uh, based on their most recent research, maybe if the board could explore that or uh, that might be useful, and uh, in that vein, I know that uh, there have been some uh, journalistic uh, investigations as well, ProPublica and a few other places have done uh, some really nice kind of data gathering, and um, I'd like to see that that data um, at some point might be helpful for us. Thank you. I mean, also there's a report this week released by the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, which talks about the phenomenon of... Uh, the flipping phenomenon going on in New York City, and it's really, uh, people have had a chance to look at that this week. It's, I think something is worth that we should be sharing. It's the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, and if, I'm sure we could get someone from them to come talk to us as well. They mostly focus on the one to four family homes, but the data that they have talks about it citywide and not just related to the one to fours. Yes. Yeah, I, I just wanna go on record that I strongly prefer a nighttime Manhattan meeting uptown as opposed to, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, <laughs> I always have a but. Uh, I, 
I think I think we I don't think we need uh, one downtown from two to six. I think one uptown is appropriate. That's where the, the density of uh, rent stabilized housing is. No other borough gets two. I just think that's my personal opinion. So if we can make an effort to find a location, I would strongly support that. I was clear, not two, one. Uh, just on that, I mean, Andrew, I know I mentioned this before, that the state office building that has space on the second floor, we have people who are able to secure that location. So I think we can get the space. The issue is picking a day and securing the location, make sure it's free that night. But they have told us that the space is available for us for this purpose. Okay, part of the problem here is that we have a meeting scheduled for June 20th that I'm not available for. So that's going to have to be moved. Um, further crunching that window that we have for public hearings. So um, my, um, we're going to have to look, I think, very specifically at dates because of the what I understand is this public notice period that has to pass before we can start having public hearings at all, we end up with a very compressed period of time in which to have public hearings. So uh, if we're talking about adding uh, a hearing and also rescheduling a hearing, um, we're, we're going to be working um, multiple nights per week and we need to have some consensus on that I think I think that uh, we'll sing around this table we've all said that so we've traditionally done Monday and Thursdays if you can't do a Monday we can do a Tuesday or Wednesday I think it's far enough out that we should know hopefully most of us know what our schedule is and then we can lock that in now if you want to since the nine of us are here we can just save if you can't do the 20th Maybe we can do the 21st. I mean, we still have to... No, I basically, yeah, should, I'm, <laughs> I'm out of pocket from the 20th to the 30th, well, to the 20, whenever the final meeting is, the 28th. So it has to be before that. So you're out that week. Correct. I'm avail I, I want to make it clear I'm going to be available telephonically and email and all that because I realize that's going to be a, a very busy time. But I'm not going to be physically in New York City. The 14th or the 15th would be the days that are open on our calendar, really. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I mean. So the 14th for the reschedule? And we'll check uh, if what spaces are available also. I could, I could just let me, give me the contact, because I've been there before. I've looked at space there before, so I'm not sure which space it was on the second floor or not. It's, is it by the DHCR offices, or is it a different space? It's a state office building on 125th Street. It's right, right. No, I know. But I think I went to something there on the ninth floor once. This is on the second yeah, floor? Yeah, it's just a big open room on the second right. floor. Because the only the thing is sound and stuff like that. So I got to see what's going on with that and the ability to have more than one mic. And that was one of the issues I had there um, in the past. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, if you could... I don't know who you spoke to there. It would be great if you give me the contact, and then I can yes, go from there. Because there's some other things beyond just the space that I have to figure out. So, and so the 20th is off our calendar at this point. Yes. So the proposal is to do the 13th in Brooklyn. We're doing every day that we 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th. Is that what you're suggesting? It's either that or just, I guess, Steve's suggestion of just one hearing in Manhattan and doing it up in Manhattan if that's what people yeah. want to do. And make that uptown in the uh, evening? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine with me. So it, um, what, I'm, what I'm hearing is a general consensus around having the Manhattan meeting, the one Manhattan meeting uptown in the evening. And just, I mean, given the volume of people in Manhattan, maybe you start at four and, you know, I, don't th I wouldn't start at six because otherwise people are going right. to have to be there very late or... Yes, yeah, that's a good idea. So I think we're left with figuring out the logistics of that. No, I'm left. <laughs> Let's be honest. I, I don't. I, well, the 14th and 15th will. I, you know, hopefully it will work out. We'll find. Well, if that's what the board wants to do, we'll find space. So I have two other things to bring up around 
uh, information that we collect at the hearings um, and advertisement and sending out maybe email blasts to the folks who testified last year who were involved last year in the hearings. Um, our, what is our plan for that for this year? The plan is that you can sign up for being part of the email blast. So you have to do that on, currently you have to do that online. But what is our follow-up as a board to email them? Oh, it, we well, we, I don't know if you guys have signed up on it, but we send, every time there's a meeting, we send whenever the schedule. Up, we, I signed up, I didn't get anything. Yeah, for I day. signed up, and I haven't gotten anything either. We got the two that we did, so we're, we're good. Um, I don't know where, I mean, we should talk and see what's going on, yeah. but we did a blast. We have over 2,000 people on our blast, and we're all on it, and, we've all, and we all got it, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Well, it probably on. makes sense for all the board members to sign up and see what the process of signing up is like so we're all comfortable with it and see that we're getting the, um, the communications. So are we also the people who are testifying in a hearing, giving us their email, are we putting them on? We don't, we don't take their email when they testify. No, we don't do that. Can we do that this year? I'd rather not do that, to be honest, because maintaining that email and even just being able to read someone's email address, I'd much rather go through the system that the city supports and all the other agencies actually use that they sign up through that system because that's set up and it's, and it's the way that all of the other city agencies deal with it and we notify people that way. I'd, I'd much rather do that um, because then the person... Um, signing up has control of that, so, and not us. I just want to highlight that it's not an easy thing to just find to sign up for the RGB. Like, it's just, like, there's boxes and things that open up, and so I just feel like if we are, if these meetings are public and we want the public to be involved, we have to make it accessible for them, and I think that if we are requesting that people go to a website that is not related to the RGB to sign up for something for the RGB and we're not following up and we're missing an opportunity to that 2,400 people to be a few thousand more people that we're engaging every year. Is there a way of putting a link on the RGB site that takes there, them there directly? Is the, yeah, there is a link. There is, the okay. The main thing to sign up for the emails. Well, if there's a link, then people can go to the RGB site, hit the link and register. Is that is there a problem with that? There is. I just think there's this issue of, like, you're asking people to have a sophistication of, with technology that lots of low-income tenants don't have, where they can go to a meeting and give them their email and maybe have an email. You're asking people who are, you know, sometimes older, English isn't their first language, so there's a lot of potential technology barriers for people. Even that, people who have email addresses and email accounts. Right? Yeah, even people who have email addresses. Who, who have I a mean, lot of technology just, barriers. Right, you go to a website, it doesn't, like if you, your only access to the internet is through your phone, and the website doesn't look right, and there's a whole bunch of drop boxes, you can't actually find anything on a small screen. And so if that's the only access, which in, the com in you know, low income communities, that is a problem, where you're like looking at you know, a huge web page, and you have to be able to zoom in, and if folks are older, and actually don't know how to use a phone adequately, you're, you're actually going to fall into So all you're these saying issues. that for many people, they don't have computers, they're using their phone to access the website. Right. Okay. And so it's like drop down. I mean, everybody should go on the website. It's actually not, it took me a while to figure out how to sign up for it. And I signed up for two different email addresses, and I still haven't gotten anything, but I'll look through my emails again, um, just so that we all are aware about how it, the process happens. And I do feel like we, at, we collect emails all the time, and it's sometimes hard, and some emails don't work, but at least you're making an effort to reach out to people to make it aware that these hearings are happening, and to also just, you know, make it public. We're like, we hold public meetings, but unless you're involved in an organization or you're making contact with somebody or an act, active in your community, you actually don't know a decision that, uh, how to get involved in a decision that really affects you and your daily lives. Is there somebody from one of the tenant organizations, for example, who could come to the meeting with a computer and anybody who needed help to sign up, they could just sign up right there? I mean, I think we can do that with any government process, but I feel like it is our responsibility as a board to make that accessible. So I would suggest that it wouldn't be someone who is a tenant or a landlord to take that responsibility, for, but to have our uh, intention be that we actually make these meetings public and follow through with that by making it accessible to people. And so if we find the 
process of clicking all of those boxes when you notice what it is uh, cumbersome, then we actually, as a board, decide to do something different. Well, what about on-the-spot assistance for people who come? And we're talking right now about people who right. come to the meeting sure. and have an email address. So <laughs> what about the possibility of having somebody there who could immediately assist people in registering online? That sounds great. Um, I'm just trying to deal with the problem of taking a list of, um, you know, 100 or 60 or 100 e possibly illegible email addresses and the, just the, the labor that's involved, which may not be necessary for 90% of them because they're perfectly comfortable signing up. So... Uh, it, it would be good to know how big a problem this is, and that would also be one way of figuring that out, is how many people who come to the hearing um, feel they need assistance getting signed up. Well, we'll discuss this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm open to getting a computer there. I have one to other up. topic. <laughs> it's translation and interpretation at the meetings. Um, and I know that we have been hiring a, a group of professional interpreters to come and interpret. Um, I think we should continue to do that. I think that we should sh think through the, what languages, other languages we could potentially be using our interpretation in. We do have like organizers and people who don't do this professionally interpreting f uh, for us. And so I think we might be losing information in motion that a professional interpreter would be able to provide um, in, in, in their translation. Um, I also do feel, and, and then this is just a suggestion around, like if we do have an interpreter sitting there the whole time and majority of the testimonies are in English, the interpreter is there, we could think about having simultaneous interpretation for those folks who are sitting at the hearing and are monolingual Spanish speakers majority because of uh, the breakdowns of languages throughout the city um, and thinking that in certain communities like in the Queen's hearing we had a ton of different languages like how do we make that accessible so that we're actually getting testimony that is across the board the quality is, is good. Um, in 2014 when we had the testimony there were a few times that the, the interpretation that was given was actually questionable and I think that shift in 2015 was great but also if we're doing already sending out emails to people advertising the hearings, we should put in there that you can actually have a professional interpretation. Come and actually, well, into Spanish and English, because that's all we, we did last year, but it's for folks to be encouraged to come and testify in the language they feel more comfortable in, um, in order for us to get a diverse uh, uh, testimony from the city, since we are so diverse in the city. Well, with respect to other languages, what's your proposal? Um, I mean, I, we can, I'm trying to think of like, in Manhattan we had a few folks, um, and I think it was Mandarin, who spoke in Mandarin. In the Queens, I actually don't even know what the language is. There were a few, Ming Kwan Korean, and I feel like Night, um, Chaya, what, what language did they testify in? Nepali? Right? Bengali. Bengali, okay. So I feel like we do, we already know who comes and testify, but I think in, or, in order for us to think about how, to, how are we being accessible to the, the community, like we should advertise that we actually do have that so that folks are feeling comfortable. And you know, we did say it at the hearings, um, but people don't show up if they don't know. And I well, feel like we're missing out on that We have to have it before we can advertise it. So right, the only thing we have right now is Spanish. Spanish. So we should be advertising this. Advertising that doesn't seem to be a major problem, I mean, to include that in the announcement of the meeting. Um, but um, I defer um, to you, Andrew, about the logistics involved in providing interpretation um, in other languages. What, what are your thoughts? I'd have to take a look at, I mean, there's I'd have to think. I, I, my thoughts are scattered. <laughs> I, I'd have to think more about it to give you a, a good answer because I don't. Um, adding languages of, you know, uh, 
which ones are we targeting is the issue, and then also cost of getting all those folks there that deal with different type of languages. Mm -hmm. So I, it's not as though it's per speaker, it's for the hours that they're sitting there, and, that, and that's somewhat, um, and so it may be something that, you know, We'd, I, you know, I'd have to see where we were at and see if we're doing, and then which do we target, and then if you start doing that, you know, if someone comes in another language and we don't have an interpreter, then, I don't know. I, I, well, Andrew, I'm, I mean, not, I'm not saying no at all, but I'm just saying I don't, I don't know enough about it. I think it we need to get a little more, bit more information about the, um, how many people we may be talking about, what the costs would be, you know, what the logistics would be, whether to reduce the cost, you might have all the, try to get all the Mandarin speakers to come in a particular time, so somebody, you don't have to pay for an interpreter to be there for five or six hours. I mean, there, there are other ways we might be able to tackle this, but so, it doesn't oh, sound like, it sounds the more like the issue is that we did, since we did do Spanish last year, we did it for the people who presented, not the people in the audience. And the right. idea of doing simultaneous yeah, I was going to come to that. What, yeah. And again, Andrew, maybe you can um, give your thoughts on this simul simultaneous translation or interpretation. Um, I know from a prior conversation that I had with Harvey and Shayla that their organizations actually have the equipment necessary to headsets. do this, the headsets, I guess, are what are the issue. Um, and um, so, you know, basically anybody who wants a headset gets a headset and then they can listen to the entire proceeding as opposed to, um, you know, only being able to hear the testimony of people who are getting the interpreter services. Does, is that something we could do? Oh, we could certainly look into it. Um. I don't know if then we need two interpreters per meeting. We need someone available to actually, and then someone who's speaking the interpretation, I guess. But, but the person Just speaking that, in Spanish, that, the people with the headsets don't need it translated because it's already in Spanish. No, I realize that, but I... So um, that person who's but doing... But it's not, it, that, it's, that's actually not the issue. It's the idea of there's not going to be an interpreter that's going to talk for five hours. It's a long time. So you're going to have to hire right. another one because that, that was the discussion. Yeah, they have to hire two, so it right. doubles the It's very, yeah, very labor-intensive. Maybe, maybe it's targeting a, a hearing. I mean, certainly, the I think probably the most Spanish-speaking folks we had was in the Bronx last year, so maybe targeting that hearing and trying it out and see how it works with that one, and making it public that there's going to be translation of that. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. This is just off the top of my head. So, Unless you want to do it. <laughs> Are you offering your services? <laughs> oh yes, we we definitely have air conditioning. There's no question. I, I double check that. I double check that, and um, we may have to actually um, actually. I don't know. We may hire our own sound because the sound wasn't. It fell apart on us. They, the equipment broke down. So I think I, I'm I'm tempted to do my own sound as well. But um, I mean, the space was fine if it was air conditioned, and it will be. They promised me. If it's not, then. Yeah, it's the same place. Yeah, there's a museum, but it will be air conditioned. One I'll go check thing. with them again. But. One last thing is that we were handed uh, some letters uh, from community organizations um, about the Manhattan hearing. So I'm just going to pass it around, even though we talked about it. Thank you. It's addressed to me. Apparently so. All right, so for the record, I've received a letter dated April 7th, 2016, addressed to me as chair of the Rent Guidelines Board um, from um, what appear to be uh, about 25 uh, different organizations um, with copies to the mayor, the city council speaker, the New York City Council Manhattan delegation, Council Member Huamain Williams and the Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Did you want us to read this now and discuss it, or this is for for, for our further reading uh, and enjoyment? It was, it was in the request of having a nighttime Manhattan hearing, okay. a second hearing. So we discussed it, but I I got it, so I didn't want to not pass it around. Right, they are asking in addition. Okay, 
Any other topics for discussion or questions for me or for Andrew? No? Uh, then a general comment of everyone's willingness to actually discuss some of the data and like kind of unpack it. I think that it's really useful hearing other people's questions and other people's comments about the data um, from my own understanding and also in our discussion about how uh, how big of a decision this is that we're making and how many people are affected by our decisions. So I do really value that and also value that we want to bring other sources of information to really discuss and unpack some of our, uh, the heavy decision we have to make. So thank you. Right, I think um, I certainly second that and I can use all the help I can get from you experts in terms of figuring out um, what uh, we need to know further uh, as well as questions about the data that we've been provided with. I'm assuming that conversation is going to be the most useful after we receive the price index information so that we have kind of the full picture at least of the reports that are prepared um, specifically for the board. And maybe what we can do, we can all then after we have the price index information have some time to have that dialogue I think I know we're running and we're running out of time already because this is the first meeting, but if we can set aside in the past, we've set, you know, a half an hour, an hour just to kind of crunch through the numbers and have that conversation, I think that's always useful. Great. I think if there are uh, questions that people have in the interim, um, I know that Andrew is always available to answer specific questions, at which we very much appreciate. Um, so you don't have to just hold those questions until we discuss it as a group because it also may make our, getting those questions answered sooner rather than later may make the discussion a little more efficient when we finally all get together. Okay, um, then um, I'm going to move to adjourn this meeting. Do I hear a second? All in favor? It's unanimous, we're in adjournment.